All right, great. Well, thanks for that introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here and to uh, take part in this uh, exciting symposium. I'm John Rogers. I'm from Northwestern University. Um, I'm a material scientist and a biomedical engineer. Uh, and so I'm very interested in developing new devices, sensors, advanced therapeutic tools, surgical implements that uh, you know have relevance in, in cardiology uh, and interventional procedures related to cardiac disease. And I'll share with you a couple of platforms that are reaching levels of technical maturity that allow for deployment at scale and may intersect um, you know, strongly the, the interests of, of the audience, or that's the hope. Uh, the first is a, a class of wireless uh, skin-like skin interface sensors for ICU grade monitoring uh, of a full complement of vital signs. And, and I'll give you a sense of uh, how that works with a focus on measurements of cardiovascular parameters related to health and various uh, aspects of hemodynamics. So that's kind of the first two thirds of the talk roughly. Uh, and the last third, I'll focus on a completely different platform using some of the same underlying ideas in engineering science, but, but designed to allow for sophistication in the operation of balloon catheters for balloon uh, for ablation therapy and, um, and ca cardiac monitoring uh, in the context of interventional procedures. So really the ability to add electronics directly onto an inflatable balloon and to exploit that electronics in various um, contexts that I think are relevant to, to cardiac uh, procedures. Um, so uh, I want to begin by just highlighting the fact that at Northwestern, we have a unique institute to sort of facilitate this style of work because really sort of the boundaries between academic engineering science and clinical medicine. And uh, turns out to be a very powerful vehicle for taking some base ideas that we develop here in the lab and converting them into prototypes that can be deployed on patients downtown. And so we're very deeply engaged across the medical community here in Chicago, not just with Northwestern's medical school, but Lurie uh, Children's Hospital, Princess Women's and, and other places. And uh, that kind of interface re really adds um, a certain level of vibrancy to the kinds of engineering um, you know, research and development effort that we have uh, going on in my, in my own group. So the first platform I'll tell you about, I won't get into the nitty gritty of the underlying engineering concepts that allow this to happen, but uh, we figured out how to um, reformulate sort of silicon um, integrated circuit technology away from the rigid sort of chip-like formats that they appear in, in electronics uh, for consumer gadgetry into devices that are bi biocompatible, not only from the standpoint of the constituent materials, but also from the perspective of the geometries and the mechanics of these systems. And uh, what I'm showing here is uh, a device of that type um, adapted to and optimized for deployment on the human epidermis. And so these platforms have mechanical properties, thicknesses, thermal mass, aerial uh, mass densities that are really tailored precisely to match those of the epidermis. And so they can go on the body, much like a kid's temporary tattoo, establish a persistent intimate in uh, contact to the skin where the skin uh, can be used as a window for measuring underlying physiological processes. And this is a technology platform that we've been working on probably for the last 15 years. I think we got a pretty good handle on how to uh, how to build these kinds of devices and how to integrate sort of ICU grade measurement functionality in a wireless modality in these kinds of technologies. Maybe about 10 years ago, really started to get focused on unmet clinical needs that could be addressed with these technologies maybe five years ago. And I'll give you a snapshot on uh, where, where we are with, with this effort and um, you know, the current status of the technology, again, with the idea that the uh, outcomes could, could be highly relevant to this community. So we uh, have really, um, uh, an incredible toolbox of devices that, that are uniquely distinguished uh, by these unusual mechanical properties, much different than what you would see in a conventional uh, wearable, like an Apple Watch or a Fitbit or even an Aura Ring, which uh, are really using sort of standard and conventional ideas in electronic material science and electrical engineering in the sense that the electronic functionality is embedded in a rigid block that's then loosely coupled to the body. What we're talking about now are devices that go on the body, again, like a kid's temporary tattoo, or in some cases like a Band-Aid, and then operate in a wireless fashion where you're exploiting that skin interface to reproduce uh, many of the kinds of measurements that are part of routine practice in uh, assessing the health of a patient in a hospital, but enabling those kinds of measurements to occur continuously outside of a hospital or laboratory setting during uh, natural activities dur during daily life. Uh, and that's ki kind of the thrust of what we've been able to do. And uh, we've been able to assemble you know, a wide ranging collection of sensor modalities that, that are compatible with those types of systems. So all the ways from sort of precise thermal characteristics of the skin, we're able to measure thermal um, 
uh, distributions of temperature, thermography, thermal transport. We can measure all sorts of uh, biopotentials, again, from the skin. So doing simple things like ECG, but maybe even more aggressive things like uh, EEG. Uh, again, clinical quality. Uh, we can measure hydration level of the skin. We can even embed microfluidic channels into these platforms. So we can capture microliter volumes of sweat. Uh, we can do in situ analysis of biomarkers in sweat, uh, which in many cases sort of correlate to corresponding biomarker concentrations in blood as kind of a non-invasive alternative to a blood draw. We can do all sorts of uh, measurements in a mo mechanical domain. So we can measure stresses and strains in the skin. We can measure um, swelling. We can measure motion, stiffness of the skin, pressure pulse waveforms associated with uh, pulsatile blood flow through near surface arteries uh, and veins, all sorts of optical characteristics are also uh, possible. You can do uh, photoplethysmography, oximetry, you can do vein mapping. You can even reproduce a lot of the functionality that you would uh, you know, have with a stethoscope. So you can listen to body sounds, but again, in this Band-Aid-like format, sort of continuous big data, I guess is the point, multimodality is a possibility. And you can place these devices at any location in the anatomy. You're not uh, restricted to the wrist or the finger. You can put them on the chest or the suprasternal notch or the leg or the arm, kind of wherever they're needed. And you can run multiple devices simultaneously in a time synchronized way, as I'll show you uh, in a second. So in terms of patient population that could most strongly benefit from this technology, we decided about five, six years ago that premature babies uh, were, were a good initial target. Very challenging class of patient, but, but one where you know, the wires and the tapes and the externalized uh, data acquisition uh, hardware become uh, quite cumbersome and, um, and invasive uh, for these patients. The wires are, are heavy, they're bulky, they apply forces to the babies. It's difficult for them to move around, as I'm sure you appreciate as well as I do. The tapes sometimes uh, lead to scarring and tearing of the skin when they're, when they're removed. Uh, and all of these wires really frustrate uh, interactions, skin-to-skin -skin interactions between parents and babies. And so about five years ago, we decided if we could really make this skin-like wireless stuff work at the levels that we had hoped, ICU grade monitoring, we get rid of that rat's nest of wires, we get rid of the invasive tapes and just replace all of that with two or three of these uh, wireless skin-like patches to, to, to really improve the, the, the nature of clinical care for this very uh, precious class of, uh, class of patient. And so I won't go into the details. We're able to put all of that together, in fact, and we've done about 150 premature babies here at Lurie Children's and uh, Prentice Women's Hospitals uh, in, in Chicago. We published our first paper about a year ago, uh, and it consists of two devices, one that's going on the chest, as you can see here. Uh, this is uh, a, d a device pair that was uh, deployed on a baby in the PICU. So we're not only looking at NICU patients, but also PICU patients. That's the uh, chest units getting ECG, skin temperature. So you can get heart rate, heart rate variability, respiration rate, and approximation of core body temperature from that device. And then another device that uh, mounts on a, on a limb, either the foot or the hand, shown in the foot here, uh, that's doing full uh, photoplethysmography. And from, from that data, you get uh, blood oxygenation. And these two devices are operating wirelessly in a, a tightly time synchronized fashion. And so you can measure hemodynamics as well, sort of time intervals between when a cardiac cycle occurs and when a corresponding pulse of blood arrives at the foot. But as you can see, this, this is a much preferred way to do uh, continuous uh, vital signs monitoring in these patients that allows you know, for this kind of parent-child interaction without uh, the constraints or the cumbersome presence of the, uh, of the wires. So that was about a, uh, a year ago, about six months ago, we published uh, a paper on a more deployable, robust, um, uh, lower cost uh, platform that, that uh, is able to do the same type of monitoring. We published that in Nature Medicine uh, in March. We're paired and teamed with Save the Children Foundation, Bill Gates uh, Foundation uh, to deploy devices into various parts of Africa, India, and Pakistan in uh, you know, low resource settings where there are no monitoring technologies currently. Uh, and so there's a huge value add there. The cost structure has to be right and you kind of work through that. You can build these devices in very low cost uh, format, other places around the world as well. We have a partnership with Draeger uh, and Anthem to take these devices really at scale across populations, not only in hospital, but, but in a home setting uh, as well. And so we're very excited about that. These uh, devices sort of, sort of look like this. Again, from an engineering standpoint, we have two uh, uh, monitoring platforms, uh, as I showed you a few slides back. It's a little bit different construction here, a little bit thicker. There's an onboard power supply. It's more like a Band-Aid rather than a kid's temporary tattoo, but that's a chest pl platform. It's doing ECG continuously uh, surface uh, skin temperature. And we also have a high bandwidth uh, tri-axis accelerometer so we can get 
respiratory cycles, we can get uh, heart sounds, we can uh, monitor, uh, monitor crying events, body orientation, that sort of thing. And the peripheral uh, platform is doing PPG. Uh, it's also doing temperature, so you can get differential temperature between the core and the peripher uh, periphery uh, of the body, and that, that's an important uh, metric as well. So again, seismocardiography, electrocardiography, phonocardiography, temperature, photoplethysmography, accelerometry, uh, and temperature. And these are kind of derived uh, quantities that I've mentioned uh, mentioned previously. So that, that's what it looks like. Again, time synchronized as, as before, so you can capture various aspects of hemodynamics. This is what the data kind of look like, uh, very much ICU grade, indistinguishable from what you would see in a GE dash or Phillips system uh, or Draeger system in, in um, you know, level four NICU or PICU. Uh, and you can see the uh, two PPG channels here. There's the ECG, that's the SCG, so uh, heart rate, or sorry, cardiac sounds. Uh, and then you can capture respiratory cycles using the accelerometer. And you can take that data and you can uh, process it fairly easily to determine heart rate, SpO2, respiration rate, temperature, both of the chest uh, and the limb uh, with quantitative uh, correlations to gold standards, which are being shown here uh, with, the, with the red lines, essentially overlapped with the data captured with these wireless devices. Um, but the, the other thing, as I mentioned before, is because you have time synchronization, you're also capturing uh, pulse wave velocity. And as probably many of you know, there are correlations that allow you to, with a calibration factor, convert pulse transit time or pulse wave velocity into systolic blood pressure. And so that's something that we're looking at now and establishing correlations to uh, invasive arterial lines as a continuous beat-to-beat -beat measurement of both systolic and diastolic blood pressure. And for these particular uh, you know, sets of patients, you know, the correlations look quite good, quite promising, and that's, that's something we're quite uh, excited about as well, because that would go beyond the standard of care, being able to measure non-invasively uh, pressure, uh, blood pressure in, in, these, uh, in these patients. And so I'm sure many of you are, are aware of uh, other kinds of ECG patches that are out there. This is the Zio, uh, Zio patch in particular. Uh, and the system that we're talking about now is highly differentiated from these patches because we have, it's a binodal system. So you're capturing SpO2 as well as uh, direct cardiac activity from, from the chest. They're much smaller. Uh, they're much more flexible, less invasive uh, to the skin. Uh, and they're reusable, so they have re uh, wireless, uh, wirelessly rechargeable uh, batteries. They have both onboard memory, but you can also do continuous uh, data streaming. And so it really allows you to think about uh, you know, a continuity of care where you're uh, doing ICU grade uh, monitoring while patients in the hospital, but then you can uh, track them all, all the way back to, back to the home. And I think there's a uh, really rapidly uh, growing awareness of the value of uh, remote care. Uh, given the uh, challenges that we're facing with the pandemic and this kind of technology uh, might be able to uh, address those uh, type, types of opportunities and associated challenges. It, that, that's our hope anyway, so that, that's where we are. Um, but we're also using dev these devices on adults uh, as well, uh, directly uh, in collaboration with cardiologists uh, here at, um, at our, our medical school, Northwestern's Medical School. And this is just one example of something that we're doing. We're using these devices to monitor uh, QT interval uh, in patients uh, who are um, you know, at risk for uh, various forms of arrhythmias and atrial uh, fibrillation. So you'd like to be able to capture these uh, QT interval changes. It really qu requires very high quality ECG, uh, which our devices uh, can, can capture uh, re reliably. And this is just an example. You know, we have IRB approved uh, studies uh, ongoing of uh, measurements of a, of a patient during uh, an RF ablation uh, procedure to, to address uh, atrial uh, fibrillation. And so you can see continuous measurements of ECG, SCG, these are the, the cardiac uh, sounds, again, time synchronized. Uh, and this is the PPG waveform, uh, again, time synchronized, measured with that uh, other uh, device platform. Uh, and so you can see subtle, subtle features here. You can see uh, you know, periods of, of rapid uh, heart heartbeats, uh, heart cycles. There's actually a reduced cardiac output during that period, and you can see that reflected in the reduced amplitude uh, of the oscillations associated with the PPG. You can see that here, uh, and that occurs again uh, over here. Uh, in a couple of cases, you see uh, double peaks that, that correspond to just a single 
uh, cardiac uh, cycle uh, as, as a longer systolic event. And so really, really high quality data and it's all captured wirelessly. So there's much less clutter in the, in the operating room and our collaborators find that there are advantages uh, that accrue from that. So this is with uh, uh, Dr. Rod Passman, who was, who was doing the surgery in this case. Uh, and we're, we're making measurements like this on a very regular basis with patients coming through the hospital system here. From a uh, research standpoint, I think the uh, frontier is in really studying hemodynamics, using multiple devices of this type to map out in a spatiotemporal way how blood is coursing through, through the body and, and using that information to tie back to blood pressure uh, in a way that doesn't require any kind of cuff that provides sort of arterial line quality data, uh, but just with these soft uh, band-aid type uh, stickers strategically placed across the body. And so what we're doing is we're developing machine learning algorithms that will take the ECG, the SCG, and the PPG, map it onto the arterial line output. And so we have a tremendous amount of data uh, across a number of different patients uh, here in our hospital complex that uh, capture all of that data. So they have arterial lines in, we're capturing the other th uh, three data streams, and then we begin to tra uh, train neural networks to connect all of that uh, together to go qualitatively beyond just establishing a correlation between pulse arrival time or pulse wave velocity and blood pressure to capturing the full waveforms and uh, extracting all of the subtle information that's captured in the shapes of the ECG waveform and the PPG waveform and so on. So this is an area of ongoing work, but something that we think may yield some, uh, some interesting capabilities uh, in terms of uh, a higher level of uh, analysis of the data that's being captured with our patches. So with the last four minutes, I'll share with you some work that we're doing in a completely different space, but using similar types of ideas in soft biocompatible electronics. And so skin compatibility uh, allows you to uh, build devices that are compatible with things like balloons and things like the surface of the epicardium and, and, and so on. And so you can really begin to think about surgical tools, diagnostic instruments that go inside the body. Maybe uh, over, over a longer term, you know, kind of chronic implants might, might be interesting uh, as well as sort of bio-integrated systems that could you know, track cardiac activity, maybe stimulate uh, you know, cardiac contractions in a sophisticated way. But let me just talk about these instrumented balloon catheters. So balloon catheter is typically a fairly dumb class of device in, in a sense for sort of mechanical functionality. But with these ideas in soft electronics, you can instrument the balloon with essentially any kind of semiconductor device you might be interested in. So light emitting diodes, transistors, sensors, RF ablation electrodes, pulse uh, ablation uh, electrodes for electroporation, all, all sorts of things for, for mapping and ablating, mapping temperature distributions, contact, measuring precisely the degree of contact between the balloon and an endocardial surface, for example, you can really do all of this. This is a paper uh, that we just published in Nature uh, Biomedical Engineering to give you a sense of what's possible. You can create this kind of soft electronics in a single layer or in a multi-layer type of geometry in arrayed configuration. So what we're showing here are temperature sensors, uh, electrodes, pressure sensors, all integrated on conventional balloon platforms. So there's nothing special about the balloon. This is already FDA approved. We're just adding to that type of uh, instrument to, to expand functionality that, that could have relevance in various sorts of cardiac procedures. Here's an example of um, a pulse field ablation. So this is electroporation uh, as an alternative to RF ablation, but just to show that these kinds of electrodes and interconnects and so on uh, are compatible with that uh, modality for, for ablation. And uh, this is uh, an example of an experiment that's been done in Lang Langendorf preparation of a rabbit heart. So we're doing uh, PFA energy delivery, but we're simultaneously mapping electrophysiology and we're mapping temperature and contact as well as a way to kind of feed back uh, the, the delivery of that, that energy in a way that uh, could improve outcomes for, for patients is kind of the, the idea. Here's examples of uh, data collected from, from a human heart. So this is an explant from a organ donor, uh, where we're quantitatively uh, correlating the kind of electrophysiological mapping that we can do with our instrumented balloon catheter with optical imaging techniques in a collaboration with Professor Igor Efimov at George Washington University. So the really rich design space here uh, from an engineering standpoint, we can put almost any kind of functionality you can envision on a balloon. And, and we're working closely with uh, interventional cardiologists to understand what, where, where the greatest opportunities are with, with these kinds of capabilities as a starting point. So with that, I think I'm uh, out of time. I'll just highlight again, 
uh, that I'm a biomedical engineer. I'm not a doctor, but I'm very interested in engaging with that clinical community to uh, identify opportunities where advanced ideas in engineering could have uh, benefits uh, in addressing unmet clinical needs for, for, the, for the benefit of the patient. And I talked about these wireless skin interface sensors for ICU grade monitoring and then the second topic were, were these instrumented balloon catheters. So with that, I'll just conclude by acknowledging our collaborators in engineering science. We work in a very interdisciplinary uh, fashion on the engineering side, but then we're very deeply engaged in the medical community with the medical community here in Chicago. And that's a very important part of what we do. And the purpose of that institute to sort of bring these two communities together in a productive way. But I am ultimately an academic, I'm on the faculty here and my primary duty is to my students and my postdocs. And uh, this is a snapshot of what the group looks like uh, prior to the pandemic, it's about a year old now, nobody's wearing masks here, but really outstanding collection of folks and uh, they do all the work. I just get to talk about it. They come up with some of the best ideas. And so I always like to conclude by uh, acknowledging them for their uh, hard work. Uh, and I'd like to thank you for, for your attention.